All right, folks, I uh, hope uh, you can hear me in the room there and uh, online. Thanks for joining us uh, late this afternoon for uh, what should be an engaging panel. Um, uh, I'm going to do a, a few opening remarks here, introduce our panel, and then we'll get into uh, today's discussion. Um, uh, so obviously the, the uh, title of today's uh, uh, panel is Increasing Efficiency and Transparency to Meet the Changing Landscape of the National Environmental Policy Act, which is um, a long title um, and perhaps appropriate because there's been lots of uh, changes happening lately and lots of changes uh, still under consideration. Um, this is my second Rick as a commissioner and this is the second time I've uh, chaired this panel. Um, and. Uh, it's amazing to me how much has changed on this front just since uh, doing this last year. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us today. I'm honored to have all of them here. They bring a, a very wide uh, ranging and deep experience in this area and uh, appreciate their, their willingness to participate and come up here to beautiful North Bethesda. And it is a beautiful day, so I don't feel too bad um, that you're... Uh, had to come up our way. Um, before I begin, a few housekeeping items for uh, uh, everyone in the audience and online. Um, please remember to silence your phones. Um, uh, the Q&A portion of the session will be done through electronic means like every other session at the RIC. Um, it's for virtual and in-person attendees. Um, and for those in the room, you can scan the QR code to submit questions. And um, uh, towards the end of our time today, uh, I'll uh, take some questions uh, with the help of uh, my staff over here uh, from the list of audience questions that you guys submit during our discussion. Um, and then uh, at any time during the conference for this session or otherwise, uh, we appreciate you scanning the feedback QR code and giving your thoughts on how things went. So with that, um, let me introduce our panel today. Um, first, it's an honor. and. Uh, Pleasure to introduce Dr. An Anru Cohen. Um, Dr. Cohen currently serves as the Senior Director for NEPA Infrastructure and Clean Energy at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Um, An is working to make federal permitting more effective and efficient to help meet President Biden's climate and clean energy goals. She spent more than two decades working on U.S. federal climate and energy policy in Washington. She was Majority Staff Director of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and has held other senior positions in the House and Senate. Dr. Cohen was also a Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Center for Global Policy at Columbia University and has worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Center for American Progress. She has a BS in Chemistry from Trinity University and a Doctorate in Philosophy and in Earth Science, uh, a PhD in Earth Science from the, from the University of Oxford. You'll fit right in here with our NRC crew. They're very educated as well. <laughs> uh, next, we're joined by Mr. Peter Hastings of Kairos Power. Uh, thanks for being here with us today, Peter. Um, Peter leads uh, the Kairos team responsible for lic licensing, risk-informed safety analysis, and probabilistic risk assessment, quality assurance, nuclear safeguards and security, and government affairs. Mr. Hastings is a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Nuclear Industry Council, Chair of the Nuclear Energy Institute's Advanced Reactor Working Group, Advanced Reactor Regulatory Working Group, and an appointed member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Civil Nuclear Trade Advisory Committee, amongst many other advisory and leadership roles. Peter in a BS in nuclear engineering from NC State University and is a registered professional engineer in both of the Carolinas. Next, Ms. Melanie Snyder joins us today. Um, she serves as the Nuclear Energy Policy Program Manager for the Western Interstate Energy Board's High Level Radioactive Waste Program and Committee, as well as the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant Transportation Technical Advisor Group. Together with these committees, Ms. Snyder engages with the U.S. Department of Energy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and other state, regional, and tribal groups on the transportation component of the nation's programs for disposition of commercial spent nuclear fuel and high-level defense wastes. Melanie Holt, JG, from the University of Denver, and a BS in chemistry, also from the University of Denver. Last but not least, uh, we're joined by my uh, NRC colleague, uh, Mr. Chris Reagan. He uh, is NRC's Director of the Division of Rulemaking, Environmental and Financial Support Services at the NRC, as the NRC's Chief Environmental Review and Permitting Officer and the Federal Preservation Officer. Chris is responsible for leading the agency's environmental reviews. He has more than 32 years of experience as a regulator in the nuclear energy industry. He was selected for into the Senior Executive Service in 2017 and has served in multiple executive positions at NRC before being assigned to his current position in, in July of 22. Chris holds a BS, an MS in Engineering Management and a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Maryland. So thank you um, 
all for being here today. I'm looking forward to the discussion as I think our participants are as well. Uh, but to start uh, the discussion and kick us off, on, I'm gonna look to you to provide a little context for the audience on the role that uh, CEQ plays uh, with respect to, to NEPA, some of the recent uh, developments um, to the extent you can share ongoing developments um, and just set the stage for uh, where CEQ and NEPA fits in and then um, we'll start uh, with some questions about how it applies to the nuclear sector. Well, thank you, Commissioner. It's great to be here with you all today and with this um, distinguished group of panelists. Um, I know many in this room and listening um, probably are quite familiar with the National Environmental Policy Act, but I, we do have a diverse group, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes to get everybody um, on the same page. Um, NEPA became law in 1970, signed by uh, President Nixon, uh, and really kicked off a flurry of um, environmental lawmaking over that next decade um, that has uh, informed uh, and driven uh, the United States environmental work since then. Um, NEPA did really two main things. It created the Council on Environmental Quality at the White House. Um, our current chair is Brenda Mallory, and she serves, uh, she leads the council and our staff to help um, advise the president on a whole host of environmental, environmental justice, energy conservation issues. The other main thing that the law did was create this process for um, federal agencies to analyze their actions um, and ensure that what the government is doing um, is not harming people or the environment. Um, and to do that, <clears throat> public engagement is a critical piece of it. So. We like to think of NEPA and the NEPA review process as asking the federal government and agencies to sort to look before they leap. So it doesn't prescribe any outcome, uh, but it provides a process for agencies to look at the effects, the significant effects um, that their actions might have on the environment and inform their decision making that way. Um, it has, uh, as you might imagine, uh, there's a lot of agency practice. There's been a lot of litigation over the years that has um, informed um, CEQ's regulations on, um, on NEPA practice, which then each agency has their own NEPA procedures in place. Um, and it, there's really a, a lot of uh, history uh, and experience that goes into that. More recently, as the commissioner, commissioner alluded to, we actually, um, Congress amended um, the law back in June of last year, amended NEPA um, in bipartisan negotiations with the White House. And those were really the first uh, significant amendments um, since um, the 1970 uh, law. Um, a lot of the focus on those amendments are ways to uh, make um, NEPA reviews more effective and efficient. Uh, just a couple there now are um, time um, constraints for agencies when they're doing an environmental impact um, assess a statement and an environmental of two years and an environmental assessment of one year. Uh, there's another pr provision that has proven quite popular to allow agencies to be able to adopt something called categorical exclusions, which is sort of the lowest level of NEPA review from other agencies, and that has been, that's proven to be uh, quite popular, and um, we are excited about what that will mean for uh, moving projects forward. Um, so to implement those changes, as well as pursue um, other efficiency gains. Um, CEQ has been working on updating our own um, regulations. Um, and so those we put, that proposal we put out last summer 
uh, had a public comment period. Probably some of you in this room are listening um, have provided us comments on that. We are working hard right now to finalize that. It is um, this spring, um, and so I am slightly constrained about what I can say on the specifics of that rule update. Um, but the main things uh, for to understand now, and I think probably as we talk further, um, I can get into some additional um, details, is we do fully implement um, the amendments that were put in place last, um, last summer, as well as um, adding some additional tools, we hope, to agencies um, to help them um, meet the new standard, time standards and other standards, uh, but also um, be able to look at a broad range of actions uh, and be able to do their NEPA review fairly quickly from those, especially um, something called a programmatic environmental assessment, um, which allows uh, an agency to look at a broad um, collection of work um, so that there's a foundation already for the environmental assessment. And then when a specific project comes in, they can um, base their start basically from a, from a little further down the road already because of that programmatic review that's already um, um, happened. And in addition, um, providing some other ways to develop categorical exclusions. A big one, especially for the nuclear um, industry, too, is incorporating um, the really decades of case law on climate change um, and into the rules. Uh, in addition, we have uh, this year, or last year, start of last year, put in place interim guidance on greenhouse gases and climate change for agencies. Um, so I think that's gonna be an important one for the, for the clean energy sector. And the last thing I'll add, there's a lot, um, is really we see the public engagement piece as uh, incredibly vital um, to having successful programs to begin with, or projects to begin with. Um, and so the new rule has added in um, some additional um, provisions uh, for agencies to take on um, along those roles, and we hope give them some more tools um, in that space um, so that we can work um, with communities that will host projects um, early on um, so that the end product um, is something that the, the um, agencies and the project developers and the communities um, can all be happy with going forward. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Anna. I think that's a, a good table set for everyone. Just a few points of clarity. Um, the statutory changes that Congress made to NEPA was, what ve vehicles was that? Did they do that twice or just once at the Fiscal Responsibility Act? Yes, the, it was um, a part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act um, is what amended NEPA. There, there have permitting um, has gotten a lot of attention uh, on Capitol Hill and around the country, especially with all with the historic level of investment that we have from the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, moving things forward. But um, at the moment. Um, there hasn't been any other additional um, legislation passed. Okay, so for the time being, that's what we have, and even though there's lots of interest, um, uh, an even-numbered presidential election year is not necessarily the best odds to get additional legislation across the finish line, but this one has some bipartisan interest, um, and uh, perhaps uh, we'll see. Everything's unpredictable these days. You mentioned um, stakeholder outreach, and I just want to bookmark for everyone that um, we'll talk a little bit about stakeholder outreach today, and there's there's a, a role and a requirement for stakeholder outreach within NEPA, but there's also a very good um, rationale and track record for doing engagement outside of NEPA that then has a benefit for your formal um, uh, NEPA processes and for your larger project development. Um, Chris, I'm going to turn to you first, if you can just give folks a sense of uh, how you're viewing these um, statutory changes to NEPA and uh, what challenges or opportunities you see for the NRC in that regard? Yeah, so um, I'll tee off of what, what Anna started with, with, you know, opportunities. 
Um, Chair Hansen yesterday said, you know, be the optimist, see the opportunity isn't a problem. The, Ine the FRA, uh, I won't say snuck up on us, but you know, it, you know, last summer it required um, some fairly significant changes. Um, it made our life very exciting, um, but there are so many opportunities for us to, to implement changes to the way we approach environmental reviews. Um, there were, you know, Anna mentioned um, public engagement, talked about um, some of the uh, areas that might include um, you know, how we approach uh, doing environmental reviews for environmental impact statements, um, categorical exclusions, um, environmental, assess environmental uh, assessments. Um, so, so there's lots there. Um, specifically, one of the things that also comes to mind is, is the amount of cooperation and collaboration we have throughout the federal government. Um, we've been looking at um, establishing memorandum, memorandums of other understanding with some of our partner or other federal agencies to ensure we're not duplicating our environmental reviews. Um, we looked at um, potentially, you know, one of the items from FRA is, you know, can an applicant develop a draft EIS or draft EA and submit that as part of their application to the agency for a review rather than having the agency or the NRC do that from scratch. Um, and then also in the way of outreach and public engagement, the FRA really has provided us a platform or a foundation to, to really ramp up our, our pre-application uh, engagements with stakeholders. Um, and this is when I say stakeholders, it includes, you know, our state and local governments, uh, the public, uh, our tribal communities. And we, we have seen tremendous benefit from, you know, sticking to that adage of, you know, early and often communication. Um, and have had great success in multiple arenas with tribal communities and uh, with state and local governments to proactively get, get the word out there and prepare folks for what the actual licensing action and environmental review may look like. Thanks, Chris. Um, Peter, Peter, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, hoping you can give folks just a little bit of sense of what Kairos is doing. Um, you know, in, you know, your project or your uh, your, your, your full project, uh, some of it started before these NEPA changes and some of it will continue after these NEPA changes. Um, so maybe tell a little bit about your uh, uh, experience prior and then what is, you think it's going to look like going forward. Yeah, uh, happy to and, and uh, thanks for the invitation to, to participate on this uh, August team. I feel humbled to be uh, among uh, this team. <clears throat> so we did, uh, uh, we, we were well underway for the Hermes uh, construction permit application review when the changes occurred. We were asked uh, sort of in real time if it was likely to impact what was going on and we were far enough down the road by that point and the, the NRC staff were already doing a lot of the things that were uh, uh, in, in the FRA that we didn't perceive an immediate impact and, and going back to, to sort of force that some of the almost procedural changes wouldn't have been in anybody's benefit. So, uh, you know, it was a, a bit of a no never mind for the, for the Hermes application. Um, and of course that experience was, uh, was very positive for us. Uh, the Hermes construction permit was issued in December after less than two years of, of staff review, so a real win. Uh, the Hermes II application, uh, construction permit application was submitted earlier this year, um, and it's going to give us uh, all an opportunity to sort of test drive the new way of thinking. Uh, influenced by the FRA, not sure, but um, uh, the, the staff leaned into the notion of uh, pursuing an environmental assessment in lieu of an EIS. Uh, Hermes II seems like the, the perfect opportunity to do that. It's the same design as was just licensed. Um, it's on the same site right next door. Uh, so it should be a, a relatively easy lift to, to help test drive what that's gonna look like uh, for something that's, that's uh, bigger than a research reactor. I think going forward, um, that kind of approach to look for opportunities to streamline the process uh, to make use of EAs when it's appropriate, uh, maybe even start heading in the direction of categorical exclusions where it makes sense uh, is, uh, is, a, is a positive. Uh, with the number of applications that we anticipate uh, going through as a, as a country and, and for the regulator, 
uh, those kind of process improvements are going to be absolutely necessary if we're going to meet uh, national and, and international climate goals. Uh, Chris mentioned one of the provisions of, of FRA is the opportunity for the applicant to, to submit essentially the draft environmental review document, whether it's an EIS or an EA. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I, I don't think it's a particularly heavy lift uh, because the guidance for applicant production of an environmental report, which is the input to the environmental impact statement or the, or the EA, is already formatted very consistently with the EIS. Uh, there's uh, certainly an opportunity for some collaboration between industry and the staff to look for any deltas between what we're used to producing and what the staff is used to producing just to make sure there are no, uh, no holes. Uh, but that's a, that's a relatively easy conversation and seems like a, a real efficiency gain for, for everybody, for both the applicant and the, and the staff. Yeah. I, I was, um, I've been on the, the, the commission for a little over a year and a half now and I was surprised surprised uh, after joining after a while to learn that traditionally we don't use EAs, um, which is a little bit unique for, for agencies that do environmental uh, reviews. But it also made sense too because we do kind of large one-off projects. We don't necessarily do, haven't done multiple of the same thing in adjacent or identical sites. but. The Hermes project from Kairos has come along kind of at the perfect time for us to test this out um, as we move to the you know the the the, the second phase of Hermes and um, it'll be um, it'll be a good opportunity and Chris I hope you agree because it's you're gonna have to do it uh, for for the, uh, uh, the you know the NRC to kick the tires on this and uh, it's you know not just gonna we're not gonna have to do it just from an operational perspective internally with the with the license applicant but there's going to be some measure of helping explain to the local community and interested stakeholders why we're doing it this way when we haven't necessarily normally done it that way before, why it's, uh, how they can participate, why they shouldn't be concerned that there's any shortcutting going on. It's just a different process that has uh, a different uh, base of, of, of facts that help lead to the second step. Um, so can you Talk a little bit about how heavy a lift, even though in theory it's going to make life easier, uh, how heavy of a lift is it going to be for your staff to do things in a different way and how are you going to help communicate uh, uh, to the local communities what you're doing? So this, you know, thanks, thanks for the question. It's, um, it's kind of a double barrel question. Um, one, there's the external communication to make sure folks understand why we do the things or why we're doing the things that we're doing. Uh, a certain way uh, and a shift from from what the past process has looked like um, as far as you know the lift you know I would like to look at it as a uh, an opportunity to, to like you mentioned like you mentioned test the the opportunity to be more efficient um, it, it is uh, it is new it is different um, I have outstanding staff in my en uh, environmental center of expertise. It's a small number, but they're um, f a phenomenal group that tackle the environmental reviews throughout the entire agencies, all of our different business lines uh, and different areas. Um, but there's a constant, you know, I think this, when I went, talked about being exciting times about change, we haven't seen change in environmental reviews of this magnitude in decades. And you know, having the simply having the opportunity, I'll use that word again, having the opportunity to try different things, look at different things, um, uh, try different processes, um, it does come with some challenges and some extra effort, but the return on investment could be significant longer on, you know, further on down the road. And that's really what we're after. Um, you know, I, I could cite, you know, when people focus on FRA is like page limits and time limits is the big thing that people talk about the most, but embedded in FRA are so many other of the, of the softer things that aren't, as, aren't necessarily as clear but could pay benefits in the long run. Um, has there been an impact or is there a, sure, we, page limits was the, was the big thing where we had reviews that were in play at the time and we had to go back and look and is it going to meet the page limits? Do we have to, you know, refine it and cut some pages out or move it to an appendices to meet the, meet the legislative requirement? Yes. Does that come at a cost? Sure. But once the process is established for the long term, the expectation is there, the, uh, the precedence is there, and the benefit could be, could be significant. So um, it can be, it will be a heavy lift in the near term. 
um, but the, the long-term benefits are significant. And, and I can't help but mention one of the things we've just been talking about recently amongst my staff is, well, how are we going to tackle all of the stuff we have on our plate at the moment? FRA, uh, workload challenges, uh, knowledge management challenges, uh, resource challenges, and we're already develop in the process of developing what we call a blueprint for how are we going to tackle all this stuff? What is um, the framework for integrating all of these changes that are concurrently occur concurrently happening into our environmental review process so that we have a, um, a map or a plan for, for moving forward to get to, the, to get to the goal in the end. Thanks, Chris. Um, Peter, just so I don't screw it up, remind me uh, in the audience, your project is in Tennessee, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, which gives you the, a little bit of an advantage in working with stakeholders because nuclear is not new to them. There's some level of, of understanding. Um, but in other parts of the country, uh, like where Melanie focuses out west, um, and as a fellow Westerner myself, um, and Melanie, you're going to get this question. Um, uh, you know, there, there's not as much familiarity with nuclear projects, and there's some uh, inherent skepticism or uh, concern about you know an entity or the government's you know interests in in doing nuclear you know things related to nuclear out west with with, with storage and, and mining there's just a, a different culture out west when it comes to nuclear so can you first tell us a little bit about what the the western energy, energy board does and how they intersect on this topic and then what your experience has been like in the west and uh, maybe i'll pile on with you okay. sure yeah First, of course, thank you so much for uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, this conference has been on my agenda for quite some time, but it's my first chance to be here in person, and it's certainly a pleasure. So the Western Interstate Energy Board, or WEEB, is a group of Western states and Canadian provinces who engage on energy topics um, of various stripes. So I manage our nuclear program, which has typically focused on nuclear waste, um, specifically transportation. Um, on the electricity side of the shop, as I like to say, we talk about resource adequacy and um, energy markets and, and other items like that. So we provide a space for the Western states to talk to each other about various energy issues, develop policy. Um, other things like that. So I am going to tell a little bit of an anecdote about the High Level Radioactive Waste Committee, which I provide staff support for, and what their experience and my experience has been um, with NEPA and with nuclear projects. So around 2018 and 2020, um, the Holtec and ISP consolidated interim storage facilities were seeking, well, the, the entities were seeking uh, license applications. And I wrote and helped coordinate the comments that the High Level Radioactive Waste Committee put together on the scope of the EIS and then on the, the draft EIS. And those were mostly focused on transportation, um, encouraging the NRC to fully take into account uh, the transportation impacts associated with those projects, um, looking at the different modes of transportation. And then um, when the draft EIS came out, um, kind of challenging the NRC to, to take a closer look at some of the underlying assumptions in that, uh, that transportation analysis. Um, there were things such as that DOE was going to be the shipper, which they were legally prevented from doing. Um, there was an all rail assumption, which has typically been the assumption, but um, was not the only possible mode of transportation. Um, things like shipment numbers, um, analyses of the cost estimates, other items like that um, that were just not very well uh, supported, and that, analytically speaking. They were based on old assumptions and things like that. And so we, we submitted those comments. And when the final EIS came out, of course, had a, a very extensive section responding to all the comments that had been submitted. And it would be an exaggeration to say that the comments of the committee were summarily dismissed, but um, they were not very satisfactorily addressed, in our opinion. Um, it seemed that the conclusion of the NRC was that because of modeling and because, to be fair, of the transportation experiences in the past that spent nuclear fuel did not pose a significant radiological risk, and therefore it didn't really seem to matter that the analytical assumptions um, were based on some 
sort of unrealistic um, assumptions, basically, that uh, the conclusion had already been reached that transportation was safe and that the, the concerns of the stakeholders, um, which, you know, the states and the tribes and the public think transportation is a huge concern and a huge issue that should be addressed in these projects were really not um, of, of high concern, at least from this environmental impact statement. So there's no surprise to say that this was not a very satisfying outcome, whether from a procedural standpoint or from a substantive standpoint for, for the states who were trying to be engaged in the process and really one of the only ways they could be engaged, which was through this NEPA process. And perhaps it is um, that NEPA is not the right vehicle for that kind of engagement, um, but I think that because of, at least partly due to some of the frustrations of that experience, the states do frequently turn to the political process in order to have their voice heard, um, which has its own kind of limitations. So just wanted to provide that. That was, that was a good uh, chum for the water, so I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> can you uh, just help clarify for me and, and perhaps others? So WEEB is uh, acting on behalf of their member state in, in how you, okay. And is there, I know there's sometimes the, the how a, a state's perspective can overlap with the local city, county, or community's perspective, and sometimes a, a tribal government's perspective, but how do the, those entities fit into the WEEB calculation in terms of what you do? Or do you have any direct nexus for, with local stakeholders? We mostly engage at the executive level, so um, with energy office officials, with um, state environmental protection agencies, with, with state patrol and things like that, and then through some of the groups that we engage with, we, we talk to the tribes regularly as they talk to um, the federal government and others about transportation, so get the chance to hear their perspective quite frequently, but certainly do not represent them in any way, or, or local rep governments we work at the state level um, regional you know you you highlighted uh, helpfully that um, NEPA, NEPA provides one venue or opportunity for engagement on things but it's not necessarily the perfect vehicle and not necessarily an all-encompassing vehicle um, Peter from an industry perspective maybe you can share what you have done above and beyond or outside necessarily the context of NEPA specifically to engage the community and what the value proposition for you was in doing that? Uh, sure. So um, it, it's in an applicant's best interest to engage the community as early as possible and as openly as possible. Um, as you mentioned, we've, we've had a very productive, very positive uh, support from the community in the Oak, Oak Ridge area, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, although that's not always the case. I've been in some other areas where you would have thought the support would have been would have been good, and, and it wasn't necessarily. But um, the 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 level of support that you anticipate isn't a, a reason not to engage. Um, it's in your interest to engage a, a to try to build that level of support. Uh, or B, to know early that you're not going to have it because the last thing you want is for that, uh, that backlash to occur late in the process when, when it may be too late to do anything about it without disrupting uh, the schedule or the scope or, or what have you. Um, so we did a lot of uh, really active engagement uh, in the local community. We, we try to do that in areas where we site our non-nuclear facilities as well, uh, in Albuquerque and Alameda. Uh, we have very close relationships with, uh, with the city government, with the state government, with the local community leaders, with economic development uh, initiatives. Um, and, and we see it pay dividends uh, every time to, ha to have that level of support. Um, the, um, and I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I, I, and and the, the, the experience that you talk about is, is uh, interesting, fascinating. I, of course, I wasn't involved in that at all, but that that's a, a it seems to me to be a good example of where um, th that sort of impact at the end is what you want to try to insulate against as much as possible. Um, we did stand up for the Hermes reactor and the Hermes 2 project, um, uh, an online town hall forum uh, that's available online. I can didn't bring the link with me, but 
um, it's, it's really slick. You can go in from anywhere in the country and you can see exactly what's going on. Our CEO uh, does a number of presentations and, and it's been really productive. Uh, the one area where I'd say we do d did recognize room for improvement on the Hermes application was uh, the National Historic Preservation Act 106 consultation, um, which uh, NEPA is sort of a, a carrier wave, if you will, for that, that level of engagement and gives the tribes the opportunities to, uh, to engage. And for, for, for reasons that are nobody's fault, we had a consulting tribe on Hermes who entered the process uh, very late. Um, and it had the potential to, to disrupt our schedule. Uh, it, it very briefly assumed sort of critical path to getting the, the permit out. Uh, and it was a bit clunky because the tribe requested anonymity, and of course we completely respect that request, uh, but that forced all communications through the staff and it just ended up taking a lot longer than, than any of us would have liked. Uh, the, the discussions were productive. Uh, it, it informed our process. It informed uh, how we're gonna do construction at the site. And uh, I, you know, it was a, I think it was a net positive for everyone. The, the lesson we took away from it was that's an opportunity that we might have been able to engage even more fully in the community with some of the affected tribes uh, to try to uh, uh, enable that conversation to happen sooner. H had they still wanted anonymity because they're frankly bandwidth constrained, we believe, uh, it, it might not have helped very much procedurally, but at least we would have had the opportunity to know it was coming. Yeah, thanks. Um, and we'll probably get more into the um, interaction with tribal governments, but I don't want to give you a chance to respond to any of this. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add a couple of things. I mean, first, the NEPA process's aspiration is to be a forum where all of the um, public communities, state and local officials will have that opportunity to communicate their views um, on an action uh, with, the, with the goal, as I said, of you know achieving something um, that can be supported across the board, but uh, we don't always meet those aspirations. Um, and I really appreciate the comment about engaging with people even when you know they may not um, fully support um, the project. And you know that, is, that piece is, is really critical that all viewpoints um, are able um, to, to be able to meaningfully give their input um, on a project. I was also probably remiss when talking about the Fiscal Responsibility Act amendments and not mentioning a really important one that goes to the NEPA, the collaborative uh, nature of NEPA, um, which is the designation of a lead agency and cooperating agencies. And there's a lot of additional direction um, about when a project touches on a number of um, different agencies, authorities, and engagement, uh, NEPA really provides that umbrella to bring many of those things together, even if it um, is a permit deriving from another uh, law, like the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act. NEPA really provides that avenue of collaboration um, for agencies, and that's you know one reason CEQ works hard to to make sure that there is a robust NEPA process, so we can bring all of those things together and hopefully um, help a project that needs uh, a number of different types of permits um, to then move forward. That that is all um, organized um, and laid out uh, in a way that both the project developer and the public. Um, can understand, and the the amendments um, last year I think are going to further help um, that type of um, collaboration and uh, visibility and transparency about schedules. So, uh, Anna, in, in addition to CQ's role of uh, you know, promulgating regulations or offering guidance on NEPA changes, either statutorily required or otherwise. Does CEQ play a role where they just uh, are a clearinghouse for best practices uh, amongst agencies or answer clarifying questions about how something may or may not apply to a particular agency or project? Yes, um, that is an important part of our role. There's, in addition to our CEQ regulations, we have a whole host of guidance 
Um, I mentioned one earlier on climate change. Uh, we also have guidance on how to incorporate um, NEPA review along with the National Historic Preservation Act, Section 106 reviews, uh, and a number of other things. Um, a lot of those are going to need to be updated um, now that we have new regulations, and that is definitely on my team's list of things to do. Um, that's you know going to take a while, but in the meantime, um, we have agencies call us up every day um, asking questions about particular projects or approaches. Um, we have some all of that information actually is on NEPA.gov, so you can go there and um, get um, more information that you may want. But that, we do try and serve as a resource. Um, we've actually set up a number of working groups um, recently to help with some of these things. I, we've Everyone has mentioned categorical exclusions at this point. That's a relatively recent working group um, that's been um, very active for as a way for us to answer um, agencies' questions and provide them with um, other uh, tools as they're looking at um, changes to their categorical exclusions. And, and Chris, you and your team know their phone number, I assume? <laughs> <laughs> you know how to contact CEQ if need be. I'm just we've joking. Had a, I think we've yeah. had a recent uh, yeah. meeting with yeah. my team. Yeah, yeah. So. and, and I, I'd also add to that, so the, the, uh, there's a uh, Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, now called the Permitting Council, yeah. Also, is a great, great um, federal government-wide platform to share best practices, raise issues, talk about um, you know how issues might be addressed, um, uh, and and that's one that um, you know we participate in collaboratively and uh, uh, frequently, and say uh, almost monthly now. Either the SERPOs meet or the uh, the council members meet to talk about issues. FRA being one of the big ones. Absolutely. Yeah, and we had uh, a, a representative from, from FIPSI join us for this discussion last year. So um, th th there's been a little bit of mention about engaging with stakeholders, regardless of whether there's known existing concern or interest or presumed support. I alluded in my uh, keynote remarks this morning that um, any project that involves nuclear will always have the interest of one or more stakeholders. And so I think in the nuclear space, you're, uh, you're well advised to uh, err on the side of engagement and uh, you know, broad but targeted engagement. So you, you, you try not to miss anyone on the front end. And Melly, maybe I'll give you first shot at this um, because you mentioned that communication could have been better, uh, maybe in the NEPA context or not. Um, can you elaborate on what kind of uh, engagement or discussions uh, in your eyes uh, could have or should have happened? Well, there's another vehicle of communication called the National Transportation Stakeholders Forum that I'm regularly a part of, um, which is a Department of Energy a forum to talk to the states and tribes about uh, DOE's radioactive material shipments. And that is a great space where we meet regularly. We put on annual meetings um, to talk about what the Department of Energy is doing. And I hate to admit it because I'm a big free speech fan, but I think part of the reason those conversations are productive is because it is a state and tribal focused forum um, which gives that kind of government to government interaction and there's continuity of personalities so you're talking to similar people you can build those relationships especially in the tribal space the relationships are hugely important um, you really need to know people on a personal level to be able to talk to them substantively about things so a forum like that is certainly a much more satisfying uh, space to air issues and to, to kind of tackle things over a long course of time. I don't know if the NRC has uh, a cognate of any sort. Well, I, I don't know if we have a, a specific corollary, but um, you know, we try to do the best we can to identify and, and do outreach or or uh, give feedback to the licensed applic applicant as appropriate if they're looking for insights on on how you know who they should be talking to locally. Um, but we also are will are happy to receive uh, expressions of interest that of wanting to communicate. So um, sometimes, uh, you know, 
if we if we didn't find you to engage you and you're in, in a local community, you can always let us know and we'll be responsive to that. I would I would hope, um, Peter, in your work with the tribe, you know I think it's notable that the tribe that spoke up at the very last minute. Um, and even having to go through the staff to facilitate the conversation, it went very well because ultimately that tribe was okay with us approving the license just slightly before we had inked the, 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 the deal with them because they knew it was gonna happen and they felt confident. And that's, in the tribal context, that's a big sign of trust, um, so it's notable. That's exactly right. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it, one is always advised to go into a, a meeting with a tribe guardedly if you're going in to say, I promise, right? Because there's a long history of lots and lots of broken promises with the tribes. Um, and so that's the, the as I mentioned, our, our biggest lesson is we wish we had created the opportunity to engage sooner because we would have been able to develop that sense of trust earlier. Uh, and, and it did end up, end up being relatively inconsequential to schedule, uh, but it could have been a, a bigger deal, particularly if the solutions that we put on the table hadn't been satisfactory and if we'd had to iterate on it even more. Um, you know, and the, the, the clunkiness of the process, that's just sometimes you, you have to live with the, the procedures that are set forth. So. Yeah, uh, and you, you mentioned one uh, challenge for, for tribes when they engage because they often are, you know, they didn't ask for this project in uh, uh, their their backyard or near near their um, their uh, uh, designated or, or traditional lands, uh, and they often don't have a lot of bandwidth to just turn on a dime and start addressing something when they've got other issues to address. And uh, you know, one inhibitor, in my view. Uh, at the NRC is that we don't have the ability or the authority to give financial assistance to tribes to engage and expand that bandwidth. I think a lot of other, especially cabinet agencies, have the ability to do that and it goes a long way. Um, but, I, you know, you know, either, either Chris or, or Peter, you know, would that, how much would that change things uh, for, for you, Chris, or how heavy of a lift was it for the, you as an applicant to have to do it for the tribe, or if, that even, if that's even how it transpired? I don't know how you accommodated their bandwidth other than, than giving them time. Yeah, so there, you know, the Kairos was one experience. Um, it had its, uh, its challenges with respect to maintaining the anonymity of, of the tribe. Um, but we had a, a responsibility as a, as a regulator to, to reach our own conclusions relative to uh, the cultural resources considerations that we we had to uh, make findings on. Um, so yeah, it, it's better, it's part of our process. Um, I won't say it's unusual, but it shouldn't have not been unexpected that we experience things like that. Um, we do recognize that tribal nations do have some resource constraints that we ha um, um, can, uh, I would say, um, just recognize that fact. So when we're communicating with them, if they um, need more time on, uh, to respond because they are spread thin with respect to resources, we do our best to accommodate that. Um, on the flip side, we have had tremendously positive experience when being proactive and reaching out to uh, sovereign nations. You know, um, consistent with our tribal policy statement, we really want to have government to government interactions with with these tribal tribal nations um, we had a very positive experience um, with the Shoshone Bannock tribes when engaging on the carbon free power project where we were proactive in reaching out to their council um, offering to meet with them to speak with them explain to them who we are mm -hmm. right it, um, and what we do and why we do it and I think they were very grateful for that uh, the first meeting was um, uh, um, very interesting from a, you know, who are you and why are you here perspective. But after meeting with them several times, as Peter mentioned, you know, building that relationship and that level of trust, um, the same people, repeated meetings, it became much more collaborative and much more positive even before we had launched into the actual licensing activity. Um, and it was mutually beneficial because 
we were able to um, leverage the expertise of the tribes. No one knows their land better than they do. So when it comes to the cultural resources evaluation, they were extremely helpful in preparing us for what to look for um, in preparation for our licensing activities. But all of that is at the front end, laying the groundwork and building the relationship um, and trying to do that as proactively as we possibly can to potentially avoid the, you know, the last minute engagement um, that we might, might see. Um, and I think that, can, that we, can, we can do that. We should do that. It's, a, it's, our, it's our obligation. Yeah, and, and, and in that example, uh, Chris, uh, that, that tribal government was primarily or exclusively familiar with working with DOE, and they made an assumption that that was going to be this exact same thing with the NRC. I mean, we're all the federal government, right? And, uh, and you have to take a breath and explain how there's you know, differences and, and why and introduce yourself. So um, that, that, uh, that goes a long way, and I, you know, we've been kind of burying a little bit of lead here, but all of these actions are beneficial in the sense not only of helping complete required environmental reviews on, under NEPA, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a timely but, but thorough way. But oh, if you do it successfully, hopefully you head off you know, the, the need or request for um, uh, stakeholders wanting to, to intervene uh, and, and use those levers within the NEPA process, which they have every right to do. But if they feel like they've been included in the project, that they understand the implications, you hopefully could avoid that. Um, before we leave tribal stuff, though, I, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot because I can't do this, but I want to know the answer. Could anyone help describe the difference for between tribal consultation and tribal engagement? Because they're two different things. Sure, I can um, try there. Um, tribal consultation is is very specifically about the government to government conversations that happen from the U.S. Um, federal government through our agencies um, and the tribal governments involved. And while we appreciate um, proactive engagement from project developers, it really is has to be that government to government for the required consultation. Um, but then there are other um, more informal ways that I think both project developers and um, and agencies uh, interact um, with with tribes, but they're sort of, they are two distinct things. Uh, Chris may have a more specific answer. Yeah, no, for, for the most part, I think, you know, the formality of consultation has specific requirements that we need to fulfill in order to move forward with our licensing action, the closure of consultation, the um, agreement that the actions are satisfactory to both parties to kind of close that consultation. But the engagement piece should be and is part of our licensing process where we reach out to the entire suite of um, uh, interested parties in, in our licensing activities. Um, you know, stakeholders, the public, the local and state governments, um, and the, the tribal nations um, as well all fit into that, you know, the folks that we need to and should engage with. And it's in both the applicants and the agency's interest to maximize the engagement. Uh, the, the consultation uh, is, is certainly available and, and uh, it, you know, the tribe has uh, every right to, to sort of flip that switch and enter into government to government uh, consultation, but to the extent that you can sort of uh, insulate yourself from that through thorough engagement up front and, you know, hopefully enable the tribe to conclude, I don't need to flip the 106 switch because I'm getting everything I need through informal engagement is productive for everybody. Um, Melanie mentioned earlier in the example you gave that um, a level of dissatisfaction with how the comments submitted were were managed by the NRC. Um, uh, can you elaborate on that all in terms of what failed to meet the expectations or how uh, maybe a different venue or forum for uh, addressing those comments could have been helpful? Well, 
If NEPA is supposed to be helping make better environmental decision making and the transportation component ignored realities of transportation, it was not a very satisfying planning instrument, right? Um, and again, I didn't, I don't know if that's just a limitation of the boundaries of NEPA or the environmental component or, or what that is. Um, but I think that there is an interesting uh, comparison to be drawn uh, between NEPA and another environmental law of a similar era, which is the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA. Um, so NEPA's processes are, you know, kind of focused on the beginning of a project and the scoping of it and everything like that, and then um, the public doesn't really have a chance to engage unless there's a, a change or a license amendment or, or something like that. Um, contrast with RICRA, which grants through the EPA's grants um, of power to the states, uh, an ability to grant a license for a facility. So I'm thinking about the Waste Isol Isolation Pilot Plant, or, or WIP. New Mexico has a RICRA permit for the hazardous waste components um, of that facility. And that gives the state of New Mexico um, an enduring, kind of consistent opportunity to be involved in the environmental aspects and other aspects of that facility, which, you know, as you renew the permit every 10 years, you can keep up with changing environmental concerns. It's not just at the beginning of the process and it's a much more involved process. You have to talk to the state of New Mexico about what their more deep thoughts are on that particular thing. But from my perspective, being involved in that NEPA process and then seeing uh, the RICRA permit process occur, the renewal process, it was obvious that the state of New Mexico had a lot more influence on what was going on at the facility. Um, and this is a, a point that has been made by, I think it was Jeff Fettis, that maybe the licensing process, um, giving the states an actual piece of that is a better way of keeping them involved rather than um, this NEPA process that sort of focused on the beginning and has not always been satisfying, at least in the nuclear sense. Yeah. And you know, for, for folks who aren't already aware, you know, one unique aspect and challenge of doing these things out west is you also have a lot of federal land, and that is a, a, a different dynamic than where you're just working on, on private lands. Um, and with that in mind, I, Peter, I, I, maybe you can provide some insight to the um, project developers that are listening today about how you approach, you know, early thinking about site selection in terms of what's suitable for the project, but what also will, uh, I assume there's early thinking about what hurdles you're gonna have on the permitting front um, and the NEPA compliance front? So um, this is gonna sound a little bit like a, a Kairos commercial and I, I apologize, but um, we have environmental justice embedded in our mission statement which I'm, I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't read it out loud. It's to enable the world's transition to clean energy with the ultimate goal of dramatically improving people's quality of life while protecting the environment. And so we, we keep that notion of environmental justice in front of us in, in everything we do, including siting. And so we have a very strong preference for siting uh, on, on brownfield sites whenever practical, just to, to minimize the overall uh, environmental impact. We try to conduct as much meaningful uh, outreach as we can, which we've, we've talked about. We support economic development, and of course, we're, we're all about a technology uh, that uh, inherently offers very high energy density with minimal land use, so it's, it's, a lot of that is sort of, sort of baked in. With regard to Hermes specifically, we conducted a site selection analysis that's very similar for that, for, that's conducted for power reactors, uh, with the, the distinction being that we're not a utility, we're, we're gonna own and operate our, our first, uh, first plant, but we're not a utility, so we're not constrained by uh, a utility service territory as a region of interest. Our region of interest was the continental United States. And from there, we narrowed down based on some business case constraints around we wanted proximity to a national lab uh, to support our testing facilities. We wanted uh, to maximize the amount of uh, site data that were available to facilitate rapid licensing because of our rapid iterative approach. We, we wanted to be able to deploy this thing very quickly. Um, the, the environmental issues that we covered in our environmental review that, that in turn led to the EIS are, are, are the conventional resource areas that are uh, uh, evaluated uh, you know, traditionally for 
for all nuclear facilities. But we, we did have a, a very specific sort of set of constraints around how we wanted to select a site. We worked through that site selection process that's, that's expected as part of the, as part of the NEPA review as well. Uh, and it was very good sort of synergy between our site selection process and the, and the process that is, that's expected as part of the environmental review. Um, I'll uh, pose one more question for whomever wants to take it, and then we'll um, turn to the, uh, some audience questions. Um, you know, the NRC is a unique and complex regulatory environment to navigate. NEPA is its own complexity and ever-changing nature. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, part of the environmental justice uh, equation is also ensuring procedural justice because it's hard for a regular person, um, a small community nonprofit or a, 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 a smaller tribal community to have the bandwidth and knowledge for how to navigate all this stuff. And when you don't know how to, when you don't know the roadmap to, uh, to follow and leverage the procedure, then you'll often go look for the biggest hammer you can find and, and use that one because you're just frustrated and want it to stop until you can figure out what's going on or get someone on your side. So uh, anyone who want to come in on, on how we can improve or how we address procedural justice um, in terms of helping communities understand um, what their abilities are so they can feel like they're part of the process? I can um, start to just in speaking a little bit more about what we've done in um, our proposed rule on engagement and environmental justice. Um, a big part of that is making sure agencies are um, thinking critically about the population so that um, their notifications are going out in um, a range of a range of ways in a range of languages, if that's applicable. Um, one piece um, in the proposed rule um, is that an agency can designate um, a, um, uh, uh, an engagement officer. Um, Chris mentioned SERPO, which is Chief Environmental Review um, <laughs> Officer, so it's sort of the SERPO is equivalent for engagement um, for environmental reviews um, so that there's, you know, a specific person in an agency thinking about that. Um, so we see, as you've said a, a number of times, I mean, there's there are stories about really complex projects with sort of long timelines, and each of those tend to have a fairly unique story about why they took so long. But when you look at complex projects that have moved through in a fairly timely way, um, they all have the common denominator of good public engagement. Uh, and some of those that have been turned around from a long period, it's because there was a, a new opportunity to, to have public engagement that really helped um, move a project forward. Yeah, so. Well said. Commissioner, can I chime in on please. that one? Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about engagement. Um, I think one of the, maybe a silver lining to the whole COVID experience was looking at the value of in-person engagement. Um, you know, we have been able to take advantage of hybrid meetings and virtual meetings to reach some folks that we may not have been able to reach otherwise. But the flip side of that also is that um, for uh, community, uh, environmental justice communities that don't necessarily have things like um, internet access, um, that the in-person engagements when we hold public meetings near the site or in the vicinity or with the communities that are affected to talk about these issues and to help them understand the processes, what what we do, why we do it, and the issues at stake, and to listen to what they have to say um, is extremely valuable. So that in-person, face-to-face um, is something that we're really learning to, to take advantage of to address those issues and, and kind of help help understand what the what the dynamics are like locally in those kind of communities. 
Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to add on to that, please? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, I was just going to say, meeting people where they are and talking to them like real human beings. Um, I've been at a couple of NRC public meetings where the public is commenting, and a lot of times they're just asking questions, but the NRC is not allowed to answer any of those questions. And that's another frustrating experience where you know someone has taken the time out of their day to, to come and try to get some information about this project that is being proposed. And it's not an NRC project, but they don't necessarily understand that. And it's just this one way, it's not a conversation, it's just a one way outpouring of, of seeking something that they're not able to get. And there are, again, structural reasons for that, but it is not necessarily very satisfying. So actually being able to have a conversation with someone where some of your questions can get answered is incredibly <coughs> invaluable. Yep, green, Peter. I, I think that's a it's a really insightful question and and maybe this part of the conversation makes it worth the plane ticket for me because the just just the title of this session which includes increasing transparency um, my initial reaction to that as an industry guy is what do you mean increase transparency because for those that don't know most of you here know but the default for NRC engagement is it's public every meeting every letter every email is public unless I sign an affidavit declaring that it, and demonstrating that it's proprietary. There's countless opportunities for public engagement in meetings. The, the staff does, I, I think, a good job at standing up when the process starts, public meetings describing here's you know, what the process is gonna look like, here's your opportunities to engage. The public has the opportunity to submit contentions, uh, proposed contentions and request of a contested hearing. The public has an opportunity to provide uh, comments on the draft EIS when it's issued. The public has the opportunity to approach the commissioner or the staff at any time on any subject. And so how much more should we pander to the public, right? That's my first reaction. But it's a really good point that if somebody is wants to engage and doesn't know everything I just said, then they're just going to be frustrated, right? And that's that's where the opportunity for a, a little bit more or maybe a little bit different level of communication to, to prospective stakeholders, which we try to do as as the applicant, but but the agency could do as well, to say, you know. 90% of the people in this room know what I just said. For the 10% of you who don't, let's talk about it. Let's make sure you understand the processes for engagement. This isn't an opportunity. We're not inviting people to submit you know, 4,000 identical comments on a draft EIS, but if you're genuinely interested and want to engage, here's the opportunity to do that, and if you don't understand it, let's go talk in the corner and we can help you yeah. all. And it's that 10% that um, may be the ones that end up intervening or suing or just having a bad taste in their mouth about government um, you know working for their people and and then it has an outsized impact uh, for for 10 percent of the population um, and we all struggle with it Anna you want to add yeah I was just going to add in response to both of those last two comments um, you know we have other new energy industries that are standing up um, offshore wind uh, is a big one, and there the the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has undertaken a number of things on the East Coast that are a little more, they're kind of like a science fair setup. so there's sort of stations um, that allows the public to sort of flow through, be able to ask um, BOEM experts about various things that they are um, you know, have questions about or didn't know. Uh, in a, you know, the feedback um, from those activities is that's been a, a really way, a helpful way for um, the public to get the questions they had answered and and you know realize they had some other questions and understand those other things. So I think um, you know across the government um, agencies are trying to think about what are what are the ways that we can help um, educate people um, in rather than just a sort of hearing from them. Yeah, and those efforts aren't necessarily project specific, you're saying, but they're just like kind of like agency or sub-agency 101 out? Um, they tend to be, they do tend to be project specific. Um, so there will be a project or projects um, that will be um, being developed um, off that coast, but it, um, but it, you know, it, it provides an avenue to talk about some of the broader issues around it. Okay. I'm going to take my moderator prerogative and make one more comment on something Peter said, and then we really will turn to the audience. Um, 
this issue of uh, how can we become more transparent, um, I've been chewing on that since I got to the NRC because it, 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 something wasn't squaring on that for me because the NRC is extraordinarily transparent. In fact, to a fault, I would almost say. I think the shortcoming is it's, it's, it's transparency without context. And if folks don't understand the context for which all this stuff is being made public or available, um, they're not going to know what to do with it. It's voluminous. It's everywhere, you know. And so, like some some context and organization, uh, you know, user friendly organization that goes along with that transparency could go a long way. I mean, I'm I'm not as smart as all of you, but I'm not dumb, and I've been doing it for a while, and I have a hard time navigating NRC's website to find things that I would want. Um, and so it's those things that we got to think about. Um, let's turn the, to the audience, Dave, uh, or whomever. Uh, do you want to? Uh, the show is yours, so tee some up, tee something up. Thank you. We'll do. Um, the first question is for Ms. Snyder. Um, it's a question about uh, state implementation of NEPA-like requirements. Um, the question is: As NEPA implementation changes at the federal level, what is the prospect of corresponding changes to state equivalent environmental policy acts, and how might these changes affect NRC agreement state programs? Mm. Mm. I'm embarrassed to admit that's a little outside of my area of expertise. Uh, Anna, do you know? I can't speak to the NRC piece, but. Um, Obviously, there are a lot of um, state level NEPA type equivalents. Um, we agency, we have a number of things, uh, guidance and other um, type of products that help uh, harmonize uh, state environmental review processes with NEPA. That actually is another aspect of the um, FRA amendments to um, help facilitate that further. Um, so there already, you know, is an, a focus and an attempt to harmonize with the federal and the state review processes. Um, much like uh, the at the federal level, there's an increased focus on permitting issues. So there's been a number of state changes that have happened. Um, California had one. I think Michigan has adopted one. So there is a lot of activity um, at the state level happening on, on state level permitting too. Um, and um, our goal is uh, always to, to try and work towards some of that harmonization. Sometimes it, the new stuff is actually gonna add some wrinkles. We've, we've had a couple of questions from agencies because of the new requirements like page limits um, is impacting some of their requirements at the state level. Um, so we're, we're trying to uh, iron out those type of situations as they arise. Thanks. Next. Thank next. You. Okay, there were um, a number of questions pertaining to NRC's use of generic environmental impact statements. Um, I'm going to provide some context around that for the audience, but then I think, Chris, the question will go to you first, but it touches on others. Um, NRC, where we've seen that the environmental impacts are likely to be the same over and over at different sites for the same type of activity, we've prepared a number of generic environmental impact statements, um, whether it's for decommissioning of nuclear power reactors or license renewal of power reactors, that there are NRC generic environmental impact statements. So some of the questions pertain to uh, um, potential future guises. Um, for example, for reuse of coal sites, coal-fired uh, electric generating plant sites for new nuclear. Um, is that something the NRC is doing? Um, go ahead. Now my, my crystal ball is not quite that clear, um, but there is certainly something to be said for the benefits of generating a generic environmental impact statement that dispositions um, those generic issues, as category one issues, and kind of takes them off the table. Um, which can result in more um, uh, efficient NRC's NEPA reviews in environmental space, um, but also allows the staff to focus on those Category 2 issues that are um, unique to a particular site. So, you know, is there, has there been thought about a generic environmental impact statement for um, brownfield sites or um, old um, coal-fired 
power plant sites, not specifically, um, but depending on the nature of the reactor that might be placed on that site, there could be uh, benefit to leveraging the, the generic environmental impact statements, which we may have in place at that, at that time. So, um, but yeah, the, the benefits of a, a generic environmental imp impact statement um, really are very helpful to, to our effectiveness and our efficiency of our conducting our environmental reviews, for sure. And Anna, there was one question per, uh, to you pertaining to CEQ's views on the use of generic environmental impact statements. Um, I don't think I can speak to the use of generic ones, but I do want to thank you all for coming here rather than the competing AI focus session. Um, but that is uh, another place in the um, Fiscal Responsibility Act directed CEQ to look at um, digital innovations. Um, and I think there's a huge body of knowledge in the collective environmental impact statements that the federal government has written. They're all on EPA's website. Um, and the University of Arizona has actually taken all of those and developed something called NEPA Access so that folks can go in and put in some keyword and pull, gets, you know, returned um, uh, EIS uh, information um, f that across, you know, years, agencies that have touched on that. So I think there is, um, we're on the cusp of being able to have some additional um, digital tools available for agencies to pull on that um, body of knowledge. Um, and that will be especially helpful um, with agencies needing to look at the cumulative impact of things or one place, um, you know, another action in a certain geographic area, um, you know, can, can draw upon that existing knowledge there. So um, that is actually part of my work that I'm most excited about um, is how we can bring in um, more of the modern digital tools that we all are used to using um, to help our permitting work across the government. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And there's a, uh, I don't know if it's an irony, but it's an, an interesting tidbit that AI, you know, can potentially help solve parts of these problems or at least provide some uh, higher degree of analytical rigor and maybe some efficiencies therein. But the better AI gets, the you know, that's dependent on how much data you have and to crunch more data, you need more energy. Um, and so you may need carbon-free nuclear to power that AI that then facilitates it. So there's a, there's a cyclical uh, element here um, that hopefully will be mutually beneficial, but we'll see. Yeah. Dave, is there, are there more questions? Um, there are more questions. I'm going to st stay on, guys, just for one more question for Chris. Can you give us an update on the advanced nuclear reactor, guys? Um, it's currently with the commission. We're awaiting, awaiting commission direction on what to do next. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that would be you. <laughs> I, I voted already. All right. <laughs> Better move on. Um, for Peter, um, from an applicant's perspective, can you explain the potential difficulty of going through NEPA for every single reactor, especially once Cairo starts deploying multiple advanced reactors? How, does, how do NEPA requirements impact nth of a kind deployments? Uh, great question, and actually very similar to the, to the guy's question. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of sort of bespoke plants and, and, and one-of-a-kind applications, um, given the, the, the long history of demonstrably positive environmental impact from nuclear, particularly as measured against climate change and in comparison with fossil plants that don't have to go through NEPA, um, if the environmental review it gets even close to critical path against the safety review, then we're doing it wrong, right? When it comes to standard designs where the safety review should be pretty quick, uh, it's incumbent on us to try to look for those innovations and improvements to make the environmental review quick also. And uh, talked with, with some folks earlier today about what, what are the opportunities to make a plant design as site agnostic as possible that speeds up the safety review, 
look for opportunities within the GEIS to make the environmental review for a specific site uh, as, as quick and as painless as possible, take full advantage of the fact that these plants are licensed and permitted, so all of the resource areas under which those permits apply, one should be able to presume under the rule of reason that they're going to operate within their permits or their, or their licenses or they're going to be promptly mitigated to within compliance. Um, so, you know, the, the, the closer we get to standardized designs, uh, where the safety review is is site agnostic and and just a cookie cutter from the one that that was just done, then the the site specific uh, you know the site specific engineering contribution to the safety review is going to begin to emerge as potential critical path in the environmental review could begin to emerge as close to critical path not because it's taking longer than the safety review but because the safety review has gotten quick. Um, so that's where we're going to have to be creative and innovative and look for the kinds of innovations that, that we've uh, helped identify with, with the support of the staff and keep doing more of the same because we're not going to be able to keep up otherwise. Let me add on to that and, and, and tee something up for probably either, either Chris or, uh, or Peter. In the context of efficiencies to be gained in the NEPA, NEPA context, um, you know, some of these statutory changes about page limits and timelines, um, you know, play a role. But they can also present a challenge uh, if the quality of the inputs on the front end aren't great. And, you know, you know either Chris or Peter, talk about what, it, you know, I guess Chris to start with, um, you know, the quality of the submission of the information you get from the applicant makes all the difference in how quickly and thoroughly you can do your job, right? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like painting, right? 99% of the end product is in the preparation. Um, so these pre-application engagements that we strongly encourage from applicants to identify the issues, ensure there's a common shared understanding of what is necessary when the application is submitted, such that when it's submitted, there's you know, minimal issues. That it's all in it's all in the preparation and the pre-application, um, and we try very hard to encourage that that pre-application um, to ensure we get the the right information um, in the right format and that it's a quality submittal. Yeah, and I think you know, applicants who think they can just dump a bunch of stuff on the agency and the agency will shine it up or help them sort it out. Um, it's not the agency's job, and none of us, the agencies, have the bandwidth to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I encourage applicants for the sake of uh, efficiency as well as thoroughness to make sure that uh, you, make it, you provide a good product on the front end. Um, I know we've been going on for a while, and, and Dave, unless there's any like really burning question in there, I was just going to let the panelists uh, give any last remarks, if that's okay. I think that's it with the questions. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, let's start, uh, Chris, and come down to Anna with any last comments. And you don't don't feel obligated, but if you have anything yeah, to close I'll, with, please I'll, do. I'll keep it short. Thanks, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, this is unprecedented change. Um, I talked about our blueprint for how we're going to manage all the changes, the workload, knowledge management, staffing, resources, expertise, external engagement, internal communications, changes to our regulatory framework, all of this is occurring concurrently, and it's a lot of change. But the opportunities to make the NEPA process better, more streamlined, more efficient, um, it's all there. We just need to put the pieces together and execute. Yeah, thanks. Melanie? Yeah, I would say the, the states are largely interested in helping things happen. They just want to protect the, the safety and the environments um, for which they are responsible. And if there's a way that um, we could be better involved in the process, we're definitely open to those ideas. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll agree with everything that's been said. <clears throat> you know, I've been doing this a long time. And um, I never thought I would see the environment as ripe as it is for real progress as, as we see today. Politically, uh, uh, at, at the community level, grassroots support, a uh, startling amount of bipartisan, bicameral uh, support. Uh, you know, NEPA is just a microcosm of the, of the larger uh, sort of compelling pull for what is uh, a, 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 a world-saving technology. Yeah, and you've got major geopolitical drivers as well at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Anna? 
Um, sure. I would just close with, um, you know, for most of my career, I've been focused on how we advance climate policy, get the type of investments that we now see um, coming through the infrastructure law, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act. And so that has pivoted to, okay, what are the other things that are um, that we need to overcome in order to make this transition um, to a clean economy, uh, to meet the president's um, climate and clean energy goals. And so that has really focused on uh, permitting aspects. Um, this administration uh, is focused in working a whole of government. I haven't said that yet, so I'll probably get chided for not saying that earlier. But it really, the administration is really taking that approach. Uh, I, and I work across um, the government and the White House complex to really advance those. Um, but I think just to underscore the comment that you just made, Commissioner, it really is going to take everybody, both work agencies working hand in hand with project developers and then um, together working with those communities to make sure that we can build the infrastructure we need uh, in the time frame that we need to address the climate crisis. Yeah. So thank you all for what you're doing to, to try and achieve that. Yeah. And, and Unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time. The time is now to, to, to do these things. We're overdue, and that applies in the climate context or the energy security com, uh, context. Take your pick. Um, we need to take the same actions for the same reasons. Um, thank you all for um, participating and for your unique insights. I, I found it helpful. I hope uh, all of you found it uh, helpful at some level. And if there were specific things that you had put in the hopper to ask or just had thought of to ask, um, I'm sure uh, we can help track down any one of us um, for, uh, for further uh, conversations or questions at some point. Um, but thank you all. Uh, I appreciate it. It's been a long day for everyone in this room, including yourselves. So we will adjourn. Thank you. Yeah.